Church, so good to see everybody here today. Everybody's smiling face and praise God. Everybody welcome. Welcome. Feels good to be back in the pulpit again. We've been having Bible studies for about a month now, and now I'm back in the pulpit again. So, today we are going to be talking about faith. How many of you know that faith is an extremely, extremely broad subject? But at the same time, it's so simple. You just believe God. So, there's a few scriptures here that I added on that I don't think I added on to the presentation. Well, apparently the Holy Ghost did it because I don't remember doing it. Well, praise God for that. Because <laughs> I got up here, I was like, oh, Lord, I don't know if I added these new, these new scriptures on. You told me at the last second. It's like, well, if they're not on there, I guess I'll just have to wing it. All right. So today we're going to talk about not just faith, but pleasing faith, faith that is pleasing to God. So just based on my statement alone, if there's pleasing faith, that means there's also faith that is not pleasing to God, okay? Because you can do anything by faith, okay? But you can do it where it's not pleasing to God. But what we're going to focus on today is the faith that is pleasing to God. So what do we know about faith? What is the number one thing? Well, I say number one, but what is the most obvious thing about faith? It's invisible, right? It's not something you can actually see. Now look at me, look at look with me at Hebrews. Don't look at me, but look at Hebrews 11 and 1 through 3. It says, "Now faith is the substance of things hoped for." It's a substance, okay? It's the evidence of things not seen. For by it the men of old obtained a good report. Who are the men of old? All the people from the Old Testament, right? All the elders. And it says, "By faith we understand that the universe was framed by the word of God." How many of y'all know the words are invisible? Okay, Faith came forth out of the mouth of God. So it's framed by the things we don't see. So that the things that are seen were not made out of the things which are visible. So everything we see in front of us today were made out of faith. They were made by the spoken word of God. They were made about everything we have in front of us was made, about, made out of something invisible called faith. Okay, So faith is an invisible force. But it has a visible outcome. In other words, faith has faith fruit okay and you will know them by their fruit okay so it's also a law that operates faith is also a law according to romans that operates outside of all natural circumstances because we serve a supernatural god so everything acquainted with god is supernatural his joy yes his faith his love his healing his provision it is all supernatural so why not faith why not why wouldn't faith also be supernatural so what's the second thing you need to know? Not only is faith invisible, but I'll tell you this, seeing is not believing. How many of y'all heard this before where people said, oh man, if I lived in the time of Jesus, if I walked with Jesus, I'd have such great faith. If I lived in the times of Abraham, Noah, and Isaac, and all that stuff, and saw the miracles, and, the, and when they were wandering around the forest for 40 years, if I saw all that stuff, I would have faith. Well, how many of y'all know it didn't work out like that? Right? It didn't work out like that at all. Like the Israelites, for example, they were wandering around for 40 years and God was doing all sorts of miracles, signs and wonders from their very escape from Egypt, from all the plagues that came down in Egypt. And they did the pillar of fire, then the pillar of clouds, the parting of the sea, manna from heaven, you know, uh, splitting water, come rock, water coming out of a rock. He did all that stuff in front of them, yet they still were in unbelief, right? Because seeing is obviously not believing. And they still built the golden calf. They still worshiped another God after everything that God had done to them. Moses intervened and, you know, and saved their life once, but they were just such a disobedience. So seeing is not believing. Now, even the disciples, they saw Jesus do all sorts of stuff, right? And they walked with him. But even the disciples who were with Jesus still doubted. Still doubted. Look at this. Uh, for the example, I'll tell you about this example real quick. The, how about the example about the demon-possessed boy? Right? So the disciples couldn't cast out the demon from the demon-possessed boy, right? So they came up to Jesus uh, the man came up to Jesus, the father said, look, your disciples couldn't cast them out. So Jesus casted them out, took care of it. And then they came up to him privately afterwards and said, Master, how come we couldn't cast the demon out of the boy? We've seen you do it a hundred times. How come we couldn't do it? What was Jesus' response? Matthew seventeen twenty. Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Now, I'm just going to stop right there. Because of your unbelief. How could someone who is walking with Jesus see all the miracle signs and wonders still have unbelief? Believe it or not, seeing is more of a hindrance to you because seeing does not involve faith. 
if you see something once, you expect to see it again to be a believing out of it. So are you believing on, on, on the basis of what you see? Or are you believing on the basis of what is invisible, the same power that formed the earth? The same power that formed every single cell in your body. Are you believing under the circumstances of invisible faith? Or do you have to have something in front of you? Because if you have to have something in front of you, that's not faith. Seeing is not believing. And we see that example in the Bible over and over again. So he says, Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for truly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it shall obey you and it will move. And nothing, what he said, nothing will be impossible to you. Do you say some things? He says nothing. And this is on the basis of faith that is not seen but believed in the heart. You know why? Because it can't be taken from you. If faith was some kind of little magic bead that you prayed on every night, or if faith was some kind of little special Bible that you held all the time, and without it you felt that you didn't have faith, that's not faith. That's circumstantial faith. That's superstition. Okay? Jesus set up the Word of God to have faith in your heart, not in the natural circumstances of the world, because if you're going to serve a supernatural God, you've got to have supernatural faith. And supernatural faith does not rely on anything physical. It is completely unseen, but it has a visible fruit. Amen? Everybody with me so far? So it said, go from here to there. Speak to the mountain. And he says, nothing will be impossible to you. What about the other example? Who's probably the most famous doubter in the Bible? Doubting Thomas, right? He says, unless I touch your flesh, Jesus, unless I can stick my fingers and wiggle it around in that hole in your hand, I won't believe that you're real. I'm like, wow, Really? You walked with him. You you saw him crucified. He's right in front of you. He walks in, and you're still doubting. He's right in front of him, and Thomas is still doubting, right? But what did Jesus say to him? Look at John 20 and 29. It says, Jesus says unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are they who, what? Have not seen, but believe. That scripture right here is the embodiment of faith. Blessed are those who, who believe but have not seen. Blessed are those who don't need to see a miracle sign and a wonder to believe. Because Israelites, when they were in the forest for 40 years, roaming the desert in the forest, they saw miracle signs of wonder, but it was never enough. It was never enough. They always wanted more, and they always wanted more. God got tired of that. That's not faith, okay? That's, that's treating God like he's some kind of magician pulling stuff out of a hat, you know? As believers, we're supposed to have the power and authority in the name of Jesus to do the miracle signs and wonders because there's supposed to be signs to unbelievers, right? So if you have a person whose heart is so hard to God and doesn't believe God is real, and then you go and you lay hands on their sick child who's in the wheelchair, and they get up and they're immediately healed, guess what? You just won that unbeliever over to Christ. But once we become believers, miracle signs and wonders are not for us. They're for the unbelieving world. We're supposed to produce the miracle signs and wonders, Okay. So we get an upgrade. When you get Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God living inside of you, you get an upgrade, okay? You're the one now doing the miracle signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Ghost because of the blood of Jesus, because of him who loved you first, so we could love him back. You get what I'm saying? You've got to grow up with Christ. You can't get stuck in the milk. You've got to get the meat and potatoes and then going on, and just you have to grow in Christ. And when you're growing in Christ, you're doing everything that Jesus has done, and greater things than him will you do. Why? Because he sent us the Holy Spirit to do all these things through us. Why? So we could magnify God. So we could glorify the Father. So we can make true believers. Because that's the big difference between our religion, Christianity, and all the other thousands of religions in the world. We walk in power. We walk with proof. We walk with evidence. We walk with fruit. And we're the only one, who, only religion who has a risen Savior. Nobody else can claim that. Amen. Amen. So doubting Thomas, boy, oh boy. But, you know, that's all they remember Thomas about. But you know what Thomas happened after that? Thomas was ready to die for Jesus after that. After he believed, he was so to said, all right. Hey, we got to go over here and do this for Jesus. We might die. And Thomas was the first one to stand up. Hey, whatever it takes, man, let's go. Let's go die for Jesus. He was ready. Once he believed, he believed. So that nobody ever remembers that part. They only remember the part where he was doubting, right? So because you have not seen, but blessed are those who have seen or who have not seen and believe. So where does faith come from? Where does faith come from? Have you ever really thought about that? Look at Hebrews 12 too. It says, let us look to Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. If an author writes a book, does it belong to Schmodo down the street? No. 
Does it belong to his neighbor across the street? No, it belongs to him because he's the author of it. So Jesus is the author of our faith. Okay, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. So he starts our faith and he finishes our faith. The Bible says that whenever you set your heart to do according to the word of God, that God will see it through to the end. God will always see his promise come to pass. The answers to God's promises are always yea and amen. God never goes back on his promises. He never negates his word because that would make him a liar. But the Bible says that I am not a man that I should lie. So we know we can trust God. And we know that the faith that we operate in, it's not even our own faith, it's his faith. But we have to get a revelation of whose faith it is we're using. All our job is just to believe in Jesus. But it's his faith, it's his power, it's his glory that operates through us. But where do we get hung up at? We get hung up on the visual stuff. We say, oh, well, the doctors, they, they know best. Je- I mean, I know Jesus says that I'm healed by a stripes, but just look, look at the doctor's reports. And no, the doctor's report's a lie. Jesus is the truth. Most Christians get hung up on that. They, they believe the doctor's report over Jesus. They believe the confessions of the world and the news media and all that stuff instead of what the Bible says. And that's why Christians today do not operate in power. They're in, they're in candy land and happy clappy land or wherever they're at, but they're not doing anything for the kingdom. And I don't mean to be sound ugly like this, but they're a waste of space. I don't want to be a waste of space. I spent enough of my life being a waste of space. I spent enough of my life tearing people down and sending them to the enemy's camp. Now I want to build people up and send them back to Jesus. That's my job. And that's all of your job. I do it here in the pulpit and wherever I can, but it's your job when I tell you the truth to go deliver the truth. There is no difference between you and me. We have the same word written on our heart, and it's our same responsibility. And when we were worshiping, God was telling me something. He was saying he wants a fire to be ignited again, and he wants to take the fire that you have and direct it. And I hope you're listening. Because in these times, in these ages, the fire, the will, the devotion that God needs, the boots on the ground, if you got the fire, he will direct the flame. But if you don't got the fire, you need to light that fire up again. Amen. 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 Because he needs us. He needs these boots on the ground. All right. So where does faith come from? We said that. Look at Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross because he loved us, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In your presence, Lord, are blessings forevermore, and at the right hand are blessings forevermore. In the presence is fullness of joy, is what the scripture says, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Who is seated at God's right hand? Jesus. That's where our blessings come from. Every spiritual blessing we could need is through Christ Jesus, is through the cross, is through his blood. This faith that we operate in as Christians, this is the most powerful, powerful just force on earth because it's God. It's based on his love. That's how we are related to God is through faith. That's how we're related to Jesus is through faith. Without faith, you would not even be related to him. In the days of old, before there was Jesus, that's how all the patriarchs, that's how all the the faithful of the Old Testament, that's how they were related to God, was by faith in Him. All unbelievers were cast aside, but faith in God is what relates you to Him. Faith, Faith is your blood, that's your DNA that makes you say that I am a child of God. Back then it was a servant of God, but we're upgraded now to friends of God, to friends of Jesus. No longer servants, but friends. Servants don't always know what the Master is doing, but the friends do. The children do. We are children, friends, and sons of God. Daughters and sons of God, we should know everything that our Father is doing. So we need to get plugged into the Spirit. And the first thing to do that is to get a hold of your faith. you got to have that faith that is unshakable. you got to have that faith that lights your boots on fire, and everywhere you go, you set a flame to everything. When you go in somewhere, when you leave somewhere, people say, who was that dude? Who was that girl? Whoa! That's what people should be saying about you. So if you don't have that fire in your heart, you need to get it lit up. And if you got that fire in your heart, you need to do something with it. You're going to stay there and get burned. I don't have fire insurance for that. All right. So Hebrews 12, 2 says he's seated at the right hand of God. So we know that Jesus is the source of our faith, right? He is the finished works that we trust in. So how does faith come? Everybody knows how faith comes, right? Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. According to Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Where's the word of God? Your Bible. The words of God that you have written on your heart. So you can hear the word by you preaching to yourself, you ministering to others, by you reading the word out loud. I always recommend that you read the word out loud because that that is how it was meant to be read, is out loud. Okay? The word of God is powerful. 
And when you read the God, read the Word of God. Read, pretend like you're, you know, in front of people and ministering to people. Just, just preach it with power. Get it, get it, get it in your heart. Just, ooh. I mean, all of y'all have heard me hear the way I pray. I don't pray like a little church mouse. No, because the Word of God is powerful, and I, I can't help it. Even if I wanted to play like, pray like a little church mouse, the Holy Spirit would just, it just, it would come out of me, come right out of me. It would, there's no way just to hold that back. That's what the power of God does in a person. That's what the Holy Spirit does in a person. That's what the blood of Jesus does in you. So we cannot be resisting that. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So who is the word? Who is the word? John 1, 1 says, in the beginning, the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Why is the word capitalized, church? Because it's talking about a person. It's a noun. It's talking about a man. That's why it's capitalized, because it's a name for somebody. And who is that name? Jesus. John 1.14, And the Word and Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. Who is the only begotten of the Father? Jesus. So Jesus is the Word, full of grace and truth. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So what the Scripture is saying is, if Jesus is the Word, and our faith comes from listening to the Word, our faith comes from listening to the voice of Jesus because he's the one who's written in that book. He's the one's breath that is coming out of your mouth. He is the rhema word. He is the logo word. He is the everything. He is the living, breathing word. So the scriptures are saying that Jesus is the word. Now, if Jesus is the word and he is the author and the finisher of our faith, then what does that mean for us? That means that our faith comes by hearing the voice of Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith that endured the cross because he loves us. This is all about relationship. Your faith is 100% dependent on your relationship with God, on your relationship with Jesus, how deep you dive into the word of God or how deep you don't. Your faith is a product of your relationship with God. So if we're lacking in our faith, then we are lacking with our fellowship with God. We're lacking in our relationship with God. And I've been there before. Even as a pastor, I have slacked. I am, I am not a superhuman by any means. Okay? Everybody falls short of the glory of God at one point or another, sometimes daily, sometimes minute by minute. But God is so gracious. He is so loving. He is so merciful. He is so kind. So we know that when we are hearing the word, we're hearing Jesus. Literally, you are hearing Jesus because he was there in the very beginning, right? He was there at the very beginning. He's the one who formed the heavens and the earth. Okay, so by, he, we known him from the beginning. He's the one who put us together in our mother's wombs. He's the one who knew us before we were even in our mother's wombs. So we had a relationship with him in heaven before we came down to this earth. So why, why do we want to break that relationship off by not fellowshipping with him, by not reading his word? We have to be in constant fellowship with God. So Jesus is the source of our faith because Jesus is faith. And we grow in faith by hearing Jesus because Jesus is faith. Um, the parable of the sower says that the weeds in our heart are the cares of the world, right? But it also says that the cares of the world choke out the word. Remember that parable, the parable of the sower? So the cares of the world choke out the word. So if the word is being choked out in your life, your, your hang-ups, your, your worries, your concerns, your fears and doubts are literally choking Jesus by the throat. And saying, don't talk to me. I don't, I don't want to hear the faith. I want to sit here and sulk in my misery. I want to sit here and cry about everything that's going on in the world. I want to talk about this and talk about that, but I don't want to hear the word. You're literally choking Jesus out in your life if you're so caught up in the ways of the world. You cannot listen to what the world says. I don't care what your circumstances are. don't matter what you're going through. The solution is always in the word of God. It's never in the confessions of the doctor, never in the confessions of the world, never in the, in the confessions of anything that is contrary to the word of God. Amen? We stay in the word. And when you stay in the word, you stay in faith. So if you cannot hear Jesus talking, it's because you're listening to the problem and not to the solution. This is all part of your faith walk. So what else does the Bible say about faith? Look at Hebrews eleven six. It says, but without faith, now faith is Jesus. So without Jesus, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must at the very minimum believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. But do you see what God did there? He says, you got to come to me, but in order for you to come to me and to be a true believer, you got to first have to believe that there is a God. And once you believe in me, then he, he holds a little fishing rod with a, a treat in the front of it. I'll reward you if you follow me. 
I really would just come on this way, a carrot and a donkey, you know, whatever you, however you want to envision that stuff. But he's a rewarder. So God is showing us something here. Okay, he's saying, number one, if you're going to be pleasing to me, number one, you have to have my son in your heart. You have to be a believer in Jesus Christ if you're going to be pleasing to me, to have that pleasing faith. And he also says that he is a rewarder. So what is he doing? He's showing us his heart. He's showing us how much he loves us. He's showing us that just like us as parents who want to reward our children, he also is a rewarder too, but much more better reward, rewarder than we are, right? So the first step of having pleasing faith is to believe in God and his goodness and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, it is not even possible to have that faith that pleases God without Jesus. But why? Why is it we can't have pleasing faith without Jesus? Look at this. Ephesians 2.10. It says, For we, us, the believers, are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. So if we're not in Christ Jesus, we're not even capable of good works, which God has prepared beforehand so we should walk in them. So once we get saved, we are now able, uh, capable of producing good works. So it is now our job to walk in all the things that Jesus has called us to do. We can't just stop at salvation and go to happy, clappy churches from here on out. Gimme, give gimme, give my name is Jimmy. All about me. I don't care about you, God. It can't be like that. We now have a job. We don't are responsible for walking in the faith that is pleasing to God. So we are capable of being pleasing to God because of Jesus, right? So without Jesus, every good thing we do, no matter how good you are, you could be the, the kindest person in the world, but if you don't have Jesus, everything you do is considered filthy rags. Isn't that what the scripture says? Isaiah 64, 6. But we all are as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. So apart from Jesus... This is what you look like to God. Apart from Jesus, this is how God sees us. Everything, good thing we do is filthy rags. We need him. We have to have him. So what else does God consider pleasing faith? Now, before we get into this, let's look at the actual definition of faith. It's the Greek word pistis. It means the relationship between God and man that leads to a full assurance and conviction of the truth of God's word and character. Now, if you're familiar with this definition from old teachings, I added on to it a little bit. It's the relationship between God and man that leads to a full assurance and conviction of the truth of God's word and character. Now, these definitions are at the bottom of your sheet if you have your sheet, so you don't have to write them down. Now, where can we see this exact example right here that I'm talking about? How about the story about Judas? You remember Judas, right? When Judas portrayed Jesus? What did he do? He walked into where Jesus was. He had, was leading a group of men, betrayed him for, what is it, 30 pieces of silver? So the group of men came and arrested Jesus, right? And then what happens? Peter goes nuts. Peter gets up, draws a sword, and bam, chopped the dude's ears off. He wasn't going for his ear. He was, going to, he was trying to split his skull straight down the middle, right? Because Peter was mad. But Peter, if Peter knew what Jesus came to do, he wouldn't have done that. So again, we're talking about the disciples, sometimes completely clueless, of God's plan, okay, because they're all focused on the natural. They're not focused on what the will of the Father is. So Peter drew a sword, cut off his ear, and then what, what was Jesus' response? Now listen to what I'm going to say. Look at this, Matthew 26 and 52. It says, And Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. In the King James, it says, For those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Do you think that I cannot... Now this is Jesus talking. He says, Do you think... That right now, at this moment, that I can't just pray to my father and he will at once give me 12 legions of angels? He's telling Peter, Peter, what are you doing? Chopping his ear off. Do you think I'm defenseless? You think I don't have power? All I got to do is snap my fingers and God will send me 12 legions of angels to come to my aid. What are you doing? Chopping his ear off. Have you not been listening to what I've been preaching this whole time? Have you not been watching me? Do you not know God's plan? Why are you living by the circumstances of the world and not by faith? So he was... This is how his heart was towards Peter at that time. He says, but how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? He says, you know, I have to die. You know, I have to go with them. I've been telling you this over and over again. You know that I have to go so you can be empowered. So I can send you the Holy Spirit. But no, they weren't listening to any of that. They were all about the natural circumstances. They weren't living by faith. They're living by what they saw in front of them. So what is Jesus showing us here about faith? Well, number one. In times of trouble, faith is a choice. Joy is a choice. Worship is a choice. 
Follow God, don't follow God. Everything you do in this life is a choice. The Bible says on more than one occasion that I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. God has always given us the choice to choose life or death. That will always be our choice. That's why Calvinism is ridiculous. God didn't put us on this earth to be robots. You can't, a robot can't love somebody. We have the free will to choose God or to reject him. And we also have the free will to love him. Okay? We have the free will to love him. Because if we didn't have free will to love him, it's not love. That's fate. I don't want a robot. Well, I might ride a robot, but I don't want the robot to love me because that'd be weird. So he's always given us a choice. So in times of trouble, faith is a choice. Now, Jesus and Peter both had their free will to choose their response, right? To persecution, because what they were experiencing was persecution. So Jesus and Peter both had their free will to choose. So Jesus was fully convinced of God's goodness and plan, right, for his life. So that's why he chose God's will to go and die on the cross instead of choosing his own. Because he said, remember what he said, I have the choice. I can choose a legion of angels to come to my aid. But you know what? That wouldn't fulfill God's plan. So God, Jesus had his own will. He could at any time bow out gracefully and it would have been just fine with God. Why? Because he was perfect. Remember, when he went to the cross, he bore our sins. It wasn't his sins they put him there. It was our sins. He had no sins. He was perfect. He didn't have to go through all this. He did it because he loved us. Loved us that much. So why should we give him any less when he did that for us? We always want to walk towards him and never walk away from him. This is part of faith, church. This is part of faith. Your walk that's going to be pleasing to him is dependent on your relationship with him. And if you have no relationship with God, you're not going to be willing to sacrifice anything for the gospel. And then you're going to be dead in the water. Then your flame's going to fizzle out. And then in your heart, you're going to feel convicted until you get off of your feet and do something because the Holy Spirit is not going to let you get away with it. He will convict your heart. He will put that fire back in you one way or another. So might as well do it willingly. Amen? Amen? So just so you know, because Jesus had his own will, you know how many angels that is? The 12 legions of angels? 72,000 angels. 72,000. Because it's anywhere, depending on who you ask, it's anywhere between four and 6,000 for one legion. So 72,000 angels. Man, talk about overkill. Just for that, right? Boom! Because one angel, if you remember, one angel slew 185,000 Assyrians. This is in 2 Kings 19, verse 35, where it's talking about the one angel that slew 185,000 people. One angel. <laughs> We're talking about 72,000 of them, man. Jesus got power, amen? And he lives in you, church. He lives in you. He lives in every single believer in here. So don't walk around feeling defeated. Don't walk around thinking the enemy has a leg up in you. Are you, are you out of your, your socks? You got the greater one living inside you. You're supposed to walk around being lifted up and knowing that the, the most powerful force ever created is living inside you. The Holy Ghost, Jesus, you are supposed to walk around like a king is living inside you because he is. Amen. Amen. So this faith walk we have, it's got a little bit of pop to it. It's got a little bit of attitude, but it's an attitude of love, man. An attitude of love that decimates and destroys the works of the enemy. And you've got to get a hold of that love. You've got to get a revelation of his love because in that love comes relationship and power and glory to the Father. That's where we have the faith that pleases God in that relationship with him. So Peter didn't, show, didn't choose that route, right? He chose to live by the sword. So living by the sword, what that means is, you know, it's an eye for an eye. Basically, bloodshed equals more bloodshed. It's vengeance that Peter chose to live by. But who does vengeance belong to? It belongs to God, not us. He's the judge, right? So, Peter tells, uh, so Jesus tells Peter, the lifestyle you choose will produce a matching fruit. You live by the sword, you will die by the sword. That's what he's telling them, that your lifestyle that you choose, every decision you make has a consequence, could be good, could be bad, depending on how you choose to live your life. So does God want us to live by the sword and die by the sword? Is that what his perfect plan is for us? Absolutely not, right? Absolutely not. No, nope. God specifically states in four different scriptures that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by by faith. Who are the just? Believers. Believers in God. Believers in Jesus. Believers who trust in him. We are the just. And we're supposed to live by faith. So the term the just will live by faith is always a reference to those who are justified 
by faith in God, by faith in Jesus, not in their own works, not in their own righteousness with their filthy rags, but in Jesus, in Christ alone. Okay, those are the just. So if you're not trusting in him for your salvation, then you are not just. If you're trusting in your own works for your salvation, you are not just. The only way you're getting through heaven is through believing in Jesus. That's it. There's no Jesus and works. It's Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And that's it. Because if there was works involved, if there was anything you could do to add to your salvation, then why did Jesus die for? It was pointless for Jesus to die. If you could do it, if you could have done it on your own. The reason he went is because we could not do it on our own. There is nothing we can do to our salvation other than believing in him. That is the only requirement. And the word says it over and over again. So the just shall live by faith. And Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So the just shall live by Jesus. Amen. All right. So let's look at some examples of living faith. So these next four passages of scriptures, they're going to give us a snapshot of what pleasing faith looks like. So let's look at example number one. Habakkuk. Oh, hey, where did this come from? Oh, I forgot about that. Faith is a choice. Faith is pleasing to God, and it takes God's will into consideration. Where did that come from? I don't remember putting that in there. <laughs> okay, there it is. Okay, so let me rewind a little bit. I just want to feel like preaching today. I don't want to follow the dialogue. I just want to preach. <laughs> so, faith is a choice, right? Pleasing faith takes God's will into consideration, which is what Jesus did, right? And Peter's the one who chose to live by the sword. Okay, so we know that now. And God doesn't want us to live by, for, by the sword. He says the just will live by faith. Okay, so now we're going to look at the next examples. Now let's look at Habakkuk. Okay, so I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Now this is the conversation between Habakkuk and God, okay? And I'll explain it here in a minute. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. You know what he means by say that? He that run may readeth it. Basically, a person who is a busybody and they're always running around and have no time to read or look at anything. you got this big old sign in front of you and they're walking right by it. It's so big you have to look at it. That's what he's talking about. So him who's in a hurry, they can stop and read it because it's so big in your face that you won't have a choice. That's what he's talking about right there. So, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. So, we're talking about God's timing now, okay? But at the end, it shall speak and not lie, because God's word will never lie. Though it tarries, though it takes a little while to come to pass, he says, wait for it, because it will surely come. He says, wait for it, because it will surely come. And in verse 4, it says this. It says, behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. So, a person who is trusted in their own righteousness is not, a, is not righteous before God, right? But who is it that's righteous before God? The ones who live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So this story here, if you've never read this before, this passage of scripture shows the result of a conversation between God and Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk. Now Habakkuk had been witnessing in his own people in, in Judah, they were just sinning, man. They were just living a life of sin. And it was horrible. And Habakkuk got so tired of seeing it. He finally came to God. God, you got to do something about this. They're not listening to anything. They're not walking righteously. They're just living like the devil. Please, God, intervene and do something about this. So God, he was crying out to God. He was essentially complaining to God, asking God to do something about it. So God's response to Habakkuk was to what? To send the Chaldeans. Remember the Chaldeans? Now, the Chaldeans, God specifically raised them up. They were just, they were basically demons in, in the flesh. They were just an evil and a wicked group of people that God specifically raised up to punish Judah for their sin, okay, to punish them, okay. So Habakkuk, after all this comes down, he's confused at why God would pick such an evil nation. He goes, I, I know the Judah's acting evil right now, but these guys are really evil, God. They're like really, really evil. They make our evil look not so evil. So that's the conversation he was having with God, right? And he's like, why would you send that unjust and unrighteous people to come and, and persecute the righteous that are in there? Why would you let that happen? So he's confused, right? And he's complaining to God, asking why he's going to allow this exceedingly evil nation to persecute his people without consequence. So God responded and said to him that the time's coming when all the wicked are going to be per punished. The end times. We're going into the tribulation period. The, the, the battle of Gog and Magog. All this stuff, man, is right around the corner. God said there will come a time where all the wicked will be punished. 
And the only ones, and now listen to what he says, he says the only ones who are going to make it, the only ones who will not be shaken by the horrible things happening are the ones who are living by faith. Didn't we paint a picture earlier that we're not supposed to look at the circumstances of the world, but we're supposed to live by what the Word of God says? In the end times, they're going to be in the tribulation period, there's going to be things so horrible that are happening that says that men's heart will fail them because of fear. People are going to be so fearful in these last days of the things that are coming on, they're going to have heart attacks. They're going to die right there because it's going to be so just crazy and fearful. There's just, you know, if fear could kill somebody, he's, God is saying right here it's going to happen in these end days. That's why he's, he's, he's building us up from the very beginning. He says you cannot, be, you cannot have circumstantial faith. Your faith has to be in me alone. It has to be in the Word. It can't be in the visible stuff. Because looks are deceiving. Look what happened to the Israelites. Look what happened to the disciples. You cannot go by what you see. You have to go by what God says. Amen? That's what real faith is. You have to go by what God says. And there's a reason for that. Because in these last times, all, look at the times we're living in now, church. People run around fearful of everything. They, don't even, they say they're Christians, but they don't get one scripture and walk with it. They don't get one scripture and, and pronounce a word over themselves. They're running in fear. When this, well, it's not imaginary, then the virus is a real thing. However, they're running in fear. And what does the Bible said? The wicked flee when none pursue. The wicked flee when none pursue. Look at all these people who are running in fear, locking their doors, not shaking hands with people, not greeting people with a holy kiss, not going to church, doing everything online, sitting away. They're running. And they're wicked because the wicked only do that. The wicked run when none pursue. That's exactly what the Bible says. So in their hearts, if they're saved, they're barely saved. But in their hearts, they're not towards God. They're towards the things of the world. And and that's just the truth, church. That's just the truth. I mean, not everybody's going to like what I'm saying, but you know what? That's been my experience. That's what I've seen. And I mean it with love. But if you're going to have pleasing faith towards God, you're going to have to grow a spine in Christ. Because we need that spine. We need the boots on the ground. We need that flame of fire coming out of our boots. We can't be living like this anymore. We can't be running away from the enemy. So God's message from this event was no matter what the circumstances are, God's people will live by faith. God's people will live by faith no matter what the circumstances are. And in Habakkuk's time, he had to patiently wait upon God. Okay? So pleasing faith patiently looks and waits upon God as he brings his promises to pass. So get a hold of his promises, whatever it is you're believing for, and hold it there. Hold it, the promises right in front of you. Do not let the promises escape your vision. I don't care what the world's saying over here, it's the word of God you have in front of you. Okay? You have to, especially in times of persecution, you have to keep the word in front of you. You cannot let it escape your sight. Amen? So, so far we've learned that pleasing faith is not possible without our trust and relationship with Jesus. We learned that faith is a choice. And we learned that pleasing faith takes God's will into consideration. And pleasing faith is patient and looks at God and not at the circumstances. So if you are living a life of pleasing faith, then these are the qualities that you're going to walk in. These are the qualities you're going to have in your life. Now let's look at the second example here. Again, I didn't realize I put those in there. Well, there you go. It's not possible without a trust relationship in Jesus. Faith is a choice. Take God's will into consideration. And pleasing faith is patient and looks at God and not the circumstances. I know I didn't write these in here. Some of you sneak these in here. <laughs> All right, so example number two, Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation. Now remember, we're looking at examples of pleasing faith. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in what? In the gospel, in the power of Christ, in the blood of Jesus. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. He says that again, the just shall live by faith. So particularly what he's talking about right here is boldness. Boldness in the gospel. So this is an example of pleasing faith is boldness to share the gospel. Okay? So God's righteousness is revealed when we walk in faith. So when we're out there sharing the gospel, we're revealing God's righteousness. Because we're walking in His will. We're doing the Great Commission. We're doing what God has called us to do. And faith to faith just means living. When He says faith to faith, whenever you see that in the Bible, it just means living in continuous faith. Never being happy with this one faith that gave you this one miracle. You keep going. You make another one. You make another one. You keep walking by faith. It's a lifestyle. Treat it like breathing. 
If you stop breathing, you will die. If you stop walking by faith, you will no longer please God. And if you start walking by faith, Paul warned of an evil heart of unbelief. Let's get one thing straight. You're saved because you believe in Jesus. And if you ever don't believe in Jesus, what happens to your salvation? Were you ever really saved to begin with? In my, in my opinion, a person who is completely sold out to Jesus and truly believes can't unbelieve. That's my opinion. But there are scriptures that say that an evil heart of unbelief may lead to you falling away completely. So let's not ever walk in unbelief because it is a disease, okay? It is a disease that believers should be immune from, amen? So, please in faith, it's boldness to preach the gospel. So God's righteousness is revealed when we walk in that boldness. So faith to faith, we're living in a continuous faith that causes us to mature spiritually. So here's our third example. Galatians 3.11 now it is evident that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, for the just shall live by faith. We say it again. Remember, I said it was four times. We saw this in there. So this scripture is talking about relationship. It's talking about complete trust in Jesus. It is evident that no man is going to be justified by anything they do apart from Jesus. They're not justified by the law. They're justified by faith in Jesus because he's the author and the finisher of our faith, right? So pleasing faith is also complete and total submission and trust in Jesus. Pleasing faith is complete and total submission and trust in Jesus. So pleasing faith rejects self-righteous works of justification and leans completely on Jesus and his finished work. This is called relationship. This is called relationship. You'll hear me say that over and over again, relationship. What about example number four? Hebrews 10 and 36. He says, For you need patience so that after you have done the will of God, after you've done the will of God, be patient because after you have done the will of God, then you will receive the promise. So there's a waiting period. So sometimes things don't just happen when you snap your fingers, right? You have to walk by faith. And sometimes walking by faith means you've got to be patient, right? For in yet a little while, he who is to come will come and will not wait. Now the just shall live by faith again. But if anyone draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. Do you hear what he just said, church? So we have patience and God's will in consideration in this one, right? He said the scripture, this actual scripture is confirming three truths. One, that faith is a choice, right? And God's people are to live by faith. Faith is a choice and God's people are to live by faith. Faith takes God's will into consideration. I'm saying these again. And faith pleases God, right? So we know all this. But when he says when we draw back, we're not pleasing to him. You know what it means to draw back? Look at this. Draw back is hapostello. That's a Greek word, 5288. And it means to cower, to shrink back, to be timid, to withhold the sharing of the gospel. Man, how many times have we been in a, in a situation where we knew we were supposed to share the gospel with a person and we did it? Probably everybody should be raising their hands in here, including myself. I have been in that position many times where I knew it, the stern of the Spirit was in me. And I knew I was supposed to share the gospel, but I didn't. I drew back. And that is absolutely 110% not pleasing to God. And you know what? It doesn't feel good afterwards. When you walk away and the Holy Spirit just wrenches your gut and gets you like that, He's like, you knew what you were supposed to do. You didn't do it. Man, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good at all. So just so you know, you have now been told that when you draw back from that, that is not pleasing to God. Okay? The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. So Hebrews 10, the one we just read, adds three more truths to the type of faith that is pleasing to God. You want to hear it? You want to know what else is pleasing to God? But let patience, this is James 1, 4, but let patience perfect its work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So like I said earlier, pleasing faith requires patience. Now, perfect means entire, not missing anything. It's like this. If you had a batch of cookies baking in the oven, it just smelled so good you wanted to eat it, you just couldn't take it, you didn't wait for them to dumb you get done, you pull them out, you start eating them, you're going to get a cookie. It's not going to be as good as it was if you would have waited. To it was perfectly cooked. Same thing goes with a cake. Same thing goes with, with food. If you don't wait till it's fully cooked, you're not going to get the full experience of that dish that was designed to be 
put in the oven until it was done. Same thing with your promises, same thing with your prayers, same thing with, with your faith. If you do not wait on God to answer that and fulfill that, and you just get impatient, what you get, you may not like. You will not get the finished product. You'll get something in between, and it won't be satisfying. It's almost like drinking lukewarm coffee. It won't taste good. It won't feel good, and you'll be lacking. But if you are patient, God says you won't be lacking. Okay? You won't be lacking. Galatians 6, 9. It says, Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not give up. Did you hear that, church? If you do not give up. And that's what happens. People give up, right? People give up. We can't do that. We have to wait on God. Okay, number two. So we've got to have patience. And number two is faith requires wisdom. James 1.5 if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and without criticism, and it will be given to him. Don't ever be ashamed of asking God for help. You should be asking God for wisdom daily, daily. We don't want to operate in our own natural wisdom. We want to operate in God's supernatural wisdom because his wisdom is above our wisdom. We need his wisdom to operate in his kingdom. Amen? James 1.6 says, But let, let him ask in faith without wavering. That means without doubting. For he who doubts, he who wavers, is like a wave of the sea, driven, tossed with the wind. The wind represents the cares of the world. The wind represents all the issues of the world. And if you have no faith and you doubt, those issues of the world are going to throw you back and forth. They're just going to beat you down until you drown. You get what I'm saying, church? That faith is what keeps you going straight. That trust in God it was keep, what keeps you in the middle of the road. So despite the cares of the world beating down on you, you're still walking by faith and they can't touch you. They can't push you down. But if you start looking at the circumstances of the world, what happens? You get overcome by the circumstances of the world. And what's the perfect example of that in the Bible? Peter, walking on the water towards Jesus. Never mind the fact he was walking on water, but he looked at the storm and the storm took him down. But how faithful is God? Pulled us right up, right? God always comes to our aid, and we walk in, in faith towards him. But even when we don't, he's still there for us, because that's how good he is, right? Next verses, 7 through 8. It says, Let no man think that he will receive anything from God. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So if your faith is wavering, if you can't make up your mind, is God's word true or is it not true? Is his promise of healing true, or is the doctor's report true? If you go back and forth and back and forth, God is calling you double-minded. And he's saying that when you're praying for healing, because you're double-minded, you're not going to get your healing. Why? Because you're not fully and completely and totally convinced by the Word of God. You cannot be double-minded. He says you will not receive anything from the Lord because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But notice that the Bible says right here, he didn't say that God wasn't going to give. He said that you wouldn't receive. God is always giving. You're not always receiving because of your unbelief. You get what I'm saying that you catch that? What I'm saying, church, it's not really a faith problem. It's an unbelief problem. That means your unbelief is greater than your faith. That means you have more faith in the doctor's report than you have faith in God. It's the unbelief that's an issue. Because every person in here has the faith of a mustard seed. And with that, you can move mountains. So what's the problem? It's unbelief. Unbelief is the enemy. An evil heart of unbelief that believes the circumstances of the world over God will not see very many miracle signs and wonders, if any at all. But this is the walk we're supposed to do. This is how the just will live by faith. Amen? So we have to see this. We have to walk in this. Am I preaching to anybody tonight? Anybody get anything from this? So a double-minded man is unstable. We are not double-minded. Lord, we rebuke double-minded in the name of Jesus, Father. And we just thank you that your word will be true to us and that will be the only truth. So the next one. So how does patience and not giving up affect our faith? Because remember, this is a battle we're going through here. Let's go back to Galatians 6 and 9. It says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not give up, right? So how do we not give up when you have the circumstances stacked against you? Look at verse 10. How do we not give up? Paul tells us, look at this. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people especially to those who are in the household of faith. What is he saying? He's saying by continuing to do good, you are walking in the type of faith that pleases God. So you're supposed to be active with your faith. You're supposed to be active with the word of God. Just because there's circumstances and hiccups in the world does not give you an excuse to stop 
doing what you're doing in the body of Christ. You are always to walk in faith. You are always to lay hands on people. You are always to pray to people. You are always to witness, always, no matter what is going on. Because that is pleasing to God. That is part of your pleasing faith to God. That no matter what the circumstances say, you have to keep going. If you lose a leg, you better start hopping. But you don't stop. You don't stop, church. Amen? So by continuing to do good, we are walking in faith. By actively showing God that we love Him and trust Him. When you keep pursuing no matter what's going on, no matter how hard it gets, if you keep it showing, that shows God you love Him, and that shows God, that shows God you trust Him. So when we don't give up and continue to do, good, to do good, we are living by faith, which is the will of God. So even if we don't see the circumstances change, we always, always continue to do good, because the just shall live by faith. And we ever said that? The just shall live by faith. And sometimes coffee. Just kidding. Tacos, not coffee. <laughs> so what exactly is Paul saying about our faith? If you caught what I'm doing here, if you have to continue doing it, what is that called? If, no, if, if, you're, if you're doing the Word of God, no matter what's going on, what is that called? Obedience. That's called obedience. So pleasing faith is obedient. Okay? Faith has action. Okay? And action produces evidence because faith is active. Faith has works. So acting faith is pleasing to God. Acting faith is pleasing to God. So pleasing faith is obedient and has action that produces evidence. Active faith is pleasing to God. It has a corresponding action that demonstrates your trust and faith in God. And we're almost done here, church. This is a long one. I had a lot to say today. I had a lot to say. It's James 2.14. What does it profit, my brothers, if a man says he has faith but has no works? Can faith save him? This is such a loaded message. A lot of people will take this out of context and really mess people up with it. What he's saying right here is, can a faith that has no corresponding action save a person? Okay, If I just believe that Jesus is Lord in my mind but never believe it in my heart, will that save me? No, it won't. Okay, It will not save me. Can you save a person from hell by merely telling him, hey, you know what, I know you don't know Jesus, but you know, believe in Jesus, it'll be all right. Did I just save that person by just believing for his salvation? No, I didn't. There's something I have to do, right? Okay, or do I display my faith to that person by going and witnessing to him and telling him about Jesus and then leading him through salvation? Is he saved by the latter or is he saved by just me thinking about it? He's saved by me doing something, right? He's saying by me putting my foots to the ground and taking them over here and walking him through salvation, then that person is saved. So my faith has action, okay? I proved my faith by walking over there to that man and telling him about Jesus. Faith has action, okay? So we have to have a corresponding action to go with our faith. So what James is describing here is a dead faith, okay? It's a dead faith. He says, what is a prophet, my brother, if a man says he has dead faith but has no works? Because without works, you have a dead faith. Okay, so you can't just believe that Jesus is Lord and accept him in your mind. You have to believe it in your heart. And sometimes you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You may not believe. You may be so drawn up in science that someone's witnessing to you. and You'd be like, yeah, but science this and science that. I, I want to believe, but I just can't because my education and my science is hard in my heart to God. I, I, I have a hard time believing that God is real because science says this. Well, guess what? That person is going to have to work their butt off to come to the point where they believe. So they're going to have to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. They're going to have to do some work so they, can, so they can produce that saving faith. This is the kind of, of faith that James is warning us about. If a person's heart is hardened to the truth, they won't receive the truth and they won't be saved because they'll have, just, they'll have that dead faith. So dead faith is just a confession of the mind instead of unwavering belief in the heart. Now James gives us an example of dead faith in this next verse. Look at this. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and lacking daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, and yet you give them nothing that the body needs, what does it profit? That was the example I gave just a while ago. If a person is naked and starving on the streets, and they come knock on my store, on my door begging for food, and I just pray for them, oh, you be warm and filled, there you go, you're blessed. My faith is dead because I had the power and the ability to be able to bless that person, but I didn't. So that's dead faith right there. Faith has action. Next verse. It says in 17 and 18, So faith by itself has no works if it is dead. 
So faith by, its, by itself, if it has no works, it is dead. But a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Walk the walk, talk the cock kind of thing, right? So Galatians 6, 9 said that if we are not, that we are not to grow weary in doing good, right? Because doing good works is the evidence of our faith in Jesus. That's why we're not supposed to grow weary in doing good because it is our evidence of our faith in Jesus, and it fulfills the Great Commission. Now, true faith always has some kind of action that demonstrates that you are truly a believer or that you truly believe. Now, look at what he says right here. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So if you say you have faith, you better be ready to back it up because you will be tested on it. You need to show that you have faith day in and day out, okay? Sometimes it takes a faith that moves mountains just to snap you out of a bad mood, but you got to do it because you can't witness to anybody if you're in a bad mood. So look at this example of salvation that sometimes in order for a person to come to a saving relationship with Christ, they have to work out their unbelief, right? They have to work out the unbelief. I, I said this earlier. So you work the unbelief out of your heart to get to the point where you believe. So faith... To be delivered from oppression is a good example. If you're in a bad mood, right? You have anxiety, depression, or fear, and it just has overcome you. And it's just eating you alive. And you know you should pray. You know the answer is to pray, but you don't have the energy to snap yourself out of it. You have a fight on your hands, but you have to work. You say you have faith. You say, Lord, I know, Father, I'm not supposed to live like this. I know I'm not supposed to be defeated. I know that the spirit of anxiety and depression is not supposed to be on me right now. And God says, well, you know what you're supposed to do. Pray your way out of it. Start confessing my word. But if you do nothing, then your faith is dead. Your faith has to have action because it's not just going to happen. You've got you to fight your way out of it. So your faith that you say you have, the, the action that goes with that faith is for you to pray yourself out of it. That's the action. So James is saying the faith Without works is dead. You've got to work yourself out of that depression and get yourself to the point where you're believing God again. And then the joy of the Lord just overcomes you. All right? So I'm going to close with this last question and answer because this is how faith and works operate together. Everything we're talking about is how faith and works operate together. Okay? Now, we're not saved by works. We're saved by Jesus Christ and His finished works. All right? Just want to get that clear. But when you're walking in faith, there are works that come naturally from you walking in faith. You produce works because of your faith, okay? When you have the blood of Jesus covering you, when you have the Spirit of God in you, and you have the faith to move mountains, it is a natural thing for you to have works, for you to have fruit, for you to have evidence of your faith. It's natural, okay? That's why James said over and over again that faith without works is dead. If you are a truly believer and you truly have faith, you will have fruit to back it up. Okay, But salvation, I'm going to say it one more time, is not by works. It's by believing in Christ and Christ alone because he is the one who was perfect. He is the one who did it for us. Okay, Just want to make sure we understand that. No man can boast Okay, about salvation. It is a work of God alone. Amen? Okay, so close with this last question and answer. What are we supposed to do? Now listen, what are we supposed to do to ensure that we have the kind of faith that pleases God? What are we supposed to do after everything we've learned? What are we supposed to do to ensure that we have the kind of faith that pleases God? Number one thing to know. There's four things I'm going to tell you here. The first thing is you've got to know God's will. You have to know God's will. You have to know what's written in the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 it says, study, study, study to show yourself approved to God, not to the world, but to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Why? Because you are rightly dividing the word of truth. You're getting a hold of the gospel. It's all right, Lord, you're talking to this people. It's dispens this dispensation. This is what you mean by it. Everything's in your context. And this is what the message means. So you're studying the word to make sure that you're not in error. So number one, you have to know God's will. Number two, you have to have confidence in God's will. You've got to know God's will and you have to have confidence in God's will. 1 John 5.14 And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, if you know that He hears you, you can't know that He hears you if you don't know God's will, right? And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have the petitions that we desired of Him. Did He say maybe? 
No, he says, we will have what we have desired of him if we're doing his will, if we're praying, his, praying according to his will. So number one, you've got to know God's will. Number two, you've got to have confidence in him. You've got to believe that God is God. You've got to believe he's trustworthy. You've got to believe that he loves you. That's why in the very beginning, it says it's impossible to please God without faith. Then he also says, I'm a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. He wants you to know that he loves you, that he's going to take care of you. And your only requirement is to look at Jesus, to trust in him, to do his will, to be obedient, to do everything that he's done for us, to give to other people. So know God's will, have confidence in God's will. Here's number three, and here's the big one. You've got to be a doer of the word. You have to do God's will. Know God's will, have confidence in God's will, and you've got to do God's will. You can't be a couch potato Christian. You've got to get up and you've got to march. You've got to march in orders from the Lord. You have to do His will. Romans 12.2 Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are transformed by renewing your mind to the word of God and not to the world's confession, but to the world of God that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Did you know that you can actually prove God's will in your life by doing His will, by studying His will, by knowing His will, by walking in faith? So you, either you can renew your mind to, to uh, the media and all the things of the world, or you can renew your mind to the Word of God. Which one do you want to renew your mind with? You can tell which people that you meet on a day-to-day basis whose minds are renewed to the world because all they say is what the world says. Virus this, virus that, everybody's dying, blah, 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 blah. That's what they're saying. Why? Because their mind is renewed to the confessions of the world and not renewed to the word of God. What does the Christian say? Ah, uh-uh, I got Psalms 91. They said, no, in, in Isaiah, no weapon formed against me will prosper. No plague will come nigh my dwelling. I'm healed by the blood of Jesus. Joshua 1.9, do not be dismayed. Do not be discouraged. Have, fa- have faith in God has commanded us not to be in fear. We know all these scriptures that deliver us from the viruses and all these wicked things in the world, but... Most people, that at least the ones that I have met, are completely renewed to the world's standards and not to God. That shows you who real Christians are, and you know who you are. Not anybody in here, I know that. But people who are going to be listening to this later are going to be convicted. Good, I hope you are, because that's a wake-up call to you. You've got to get a hold of the truth and walk on the truth, because that's what it takes to have faith that pleases God. All right? So doing what the Word says proves God's will. It proves your faith and develops your character. It develops your character in Christ. James confirms this in chapter 1. Of uh, Look at this. He says, Be doers of the word and not hearers of the word, because you're deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man. Look at this analogy he's doing. If, if you're a hearer of the word and you don't do it, you're just like a man who's looking at his face in the mirror. And he views himself, and he goes away, and he immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Can you imagine that? You look in the mirror, and you walk away, and you completely forget what you look like. That's the comparison of not being a doer of the word. You immediately forget what God has written on your heart. You immediately forget what the gospel says. You immediately forget the truth that I'm sowing into your hearts right now if you don't ever practice what I'm preaching. Okay? I wouldn't be able to preach what I'm preaching right now if I didn't practice it myself. Okay? I believe in it. I walk in it. I'm not perfect. I mess up. But that does not discourage me from going forward. If anything, it motivates me, lights a fire under my butt to try harder if I miss the mark. Amen? So the scripture mirrors what James said, that faith without works is dead. This scripture is a mirror of that. So act of faith means you are a doer of the word. Act of faith means your identity in Christ is established in your obedience. Your identity in Christ is established in your obedience to his word. Amen? Your obedience to his word is how you establish your identity in Christ. Okay? So here's the fourth one, the last one. Probably the most important one of the faith walk is your motivation, the motivation of your heart must be centered on pleasing God. Not man, not your wife, not even yourself. Your motivations, everything you do in the kingdom of God must be centered on pleasing God and God alone. That's the most important ingredient of having pleasing faith is it has to be for the purpose of pleasing God. Now I'm going to go through these next scriptures really fast. Now listen. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Yea, all you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. We don't want God to resist us. 
1 Thessalonians 5.18, And everything that you do, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Did you know that, that you giving thanks is part of God's will for you? Because if you're thankful, you're not complaining. If you're humble, you're not puffed up. God is getting you in the position to where you're set up for blessing, and you're set up to operate in that faith walk. Okay, This is part of the pleasing faith. 1 Corinthians 10.31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all. Everything to the glory of God, no matter what you do. If you cannot glorify God in doing it, then don't do it because it's probably fruitless. Why would you want to waste your time in planting seeds that are never going to grow? Everything you do should be for reward in heaven. And God is the one who rewards you. So whatever it is you need, whether it's material or physical, whatever it is, God's the one who supplies all your need. You're not really supposed to supply it for yourself because it's imperfect then. If you're doing God's will and you're walking out God's plan and you're living by faith, he will shower you with more gifts than you can handle because that's how good he is. But are our hearts centered right on him? Are our hearts, everything we do is the true motivation to please him or is it to please ourselves? Romans 12 and 1, he says, I urge you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. If you're presenting your body as a living sacrifice, guess what? You're not going to be very comfortable. You're going to be pushed out of your comfort zone. If you spend your life as a Christian in your comfort zone, man, we need to have a talk. (laughs) You're supposed to constantly be in a position where you are uncomfortable. It's okay to be nervous when you go and witness to somebody. That just gives more room for the Holy Spirit to take over. But if you're always comfortable and you never push yourself beyond there, the chances are you're going to become very complacent. And chances are your heart is not going to be working to please God. You're going to get comfortable in your comfort zone. And it's going to be about you and your comfort and no longer about pleasing Him. Amen? We've got to push yourself into that uncomfortable zone. So everything that we do must be motivated out of love. And it must be centered on pleasing God. Why? Because everything we do... God will examine the motivation of your heart. Everything that you do, God will examine the motivation of your heart. Everything, no matter what it is. Here's your last scripture. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. But as we were allowed by God, we were allowed by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Even so, we speak not to please men, but God who examines our hearts. It is a privilege, church, and an honor to serve the living God. It is a privilege and an honor to be able to share the gospel, to be entrusted with it. And it's amazing to know that we can have the kind of faith that pleases Him. So in everything that you do, do to the glory of God.